Good morning, everyone. It's another happy Saturday here at Bumper to Bumper Radio. I am Dave Riccio here along with the bald Matt Allen. And <laughs> we are your KTR car guys heard here every Saturday from 11 to noon right here on News Talk 92.3 KTAR. At Bumper to Bumper Radio, we are helping you, the motoring public, have a better overall car experience. If you've got car questions, we promise to have answers, so we encourage you to give us a call at 602-277-5827, 602-277-KTR. And if we don't have answers, we're going to make something up anyway. You can also text your questions to 411-923. Today on the Bumper to Bumper Roadmap, Santa's Automotive Enthusiast Top 10 Christmas List. Gifts. <laughs> Open phones. Are you going on a road trip in two weeks? We're kicking off our fun old-fashioned family Christmas by heading out into the country in the old front-wheel drive sleigh to embrace the frosty majesty of the winter landscape and select that most important of Christmas symbols. You know we're all getting in the car here in two weeks. We're getting in the car. We're driving cross country. And, uh, you know, the last thing I want to see is someone roll in the shop on that Friday and say, hey, can I get an oil change or that Tuesday? Well, you know, Dave, we're already starting to see a little bit of that at my shop on, uh, I think it was Thursday night, 4.30, we get the frantic call from the side of the road. The woman, they're on their way from California to uh, Sholo, Pine Top Lakeside, something like that. They're by, the, they're by the airport exit. They're broken down already. Can we get in today? Well, gee, it's 4.30. It takes an hour for the tow truck. These people got lucky. They got into the shop at 5.45. And thankfully, the only problem with their car was some loose hose clamps. They had the, had the hoses replaced over the summertime. The upper radiator hose was loose, lost the coolant, caused the car to overheat. They didn't do any damage, but they didn't probably have their car looked at I'm before guessing, the before road they, trip <clears throat> before they left town. And that's something that we need to be doing because you don't want to be in that position on the side of the road like they were. They got lucky. If you're not a do-it-yourselfer and you know you need to get in the shop before you go on vac- you know, this vacation or this uh, over the hill and through the woods thing to Grandma's house. It's the, over the river, isn't it? I don't or through know. The woods. I don't know all these okay. things. <laughs> but you want to get in the shop Monday. So this is a reminder. Monday, get to the shop. If you don't have a shop, good shop. BumperToBumperRadio.com is a place to go. But you want to check it out now. You don't want to find out or get a repair two days before you leave town or even the evening before. Well, it's part of planning the trip. And, and you know, you make your airline reservations months in advance. You let mom or dad or, or Aunt Betsy or who, whoever it is know that you're coming and you're doing your shopping and got the menu going. Don't, for, don't forget about the car. Like you said, plan it. Because what we don't want to see is – and it's every mechanic's nightmare and shop owner, too. Ugh, Somebody comes it. in, and we always get the phone calls, I need an oil change, I need this. When are you leaving? Tomorrow. <laughs> I don't want to be the last one to no. work on that car. We want to have a week. Chances are nothing's going to go wrong. But when Mr. Murphy starts working here in the wintertime and you're going on a on a trip somewhere, it's bound to – that when something – could possibly go wrong. That would be the the opportune time for. Well, it to I'm gonna happen. I'm gonna pick on Bob and Clay here for a minute because he went on he went on a vacation. He drove all over the states, whatever. Did the Four Corners thing. He pulled off and got an oil change. Just thought it'd be great. I'll get one when I'm in. Knock one out, stuff. stretch my legs, take a little break from driving, and you know they when they changed the oil, they double gasketed the oil filter, so it doesn't make a seal. So I mean, he was out of oil by the next by the next shop he got to. Oil change is not is not one of those things you got to get done before you leave town. Neither is a transmission service. People always want a transmission service before they leave town, but do that two weeks ahead of time. Yeah, take your time. And I tell people that want to come in, if you we can't get you in for an oil change. What you need is all the things that go along with the oil change. We need to check your tire pressures, check the tire the tire depth, how much tread life is left on the tires, and you want to have. Three thirty seconds of an inch, probably you used to use the penny to check the tread. You put. Uh, mm. Uh, put the head in, Lincoln. I don't know. I got my names all mixed up. <laughs> George here. Washington is no, in the quarter, the quarter now. So we use we, the, we use the quarter now because that's three thirty seconds. Yes, yeah, so we use the quarter. So you want to do that, and, and these are simple things that you can be checking. A lot of people, or if you have a relationship with a shop, it's you know at my shop at Virginia Auto Service, pop in any time. We'll we'll check things for you, like the the wipers, but not just the wipers. Try your try your. Uh, you know, I use just water in my interfer- in my. Uh, window washer squirted around town but last time i did that i left town and it wasn't frozen there was enough temperature under the hood but as soon as it hit the windshield it was a sheet of ice on my windshield so you want to make sure you have the uh the proper antifreeze solution for the windshield washers well you mentioned batteries how long do batteries last in arizona depending on the battery uh three years tops 30 months typically 
So if you've got a two-and-a-half-year-old battery and you're going on a road trip, maybe it's a good time to throw a fresh battery in it two, or, week, two weeks ahead of time. Or at least, at least yeah, two weeks ahead of time. <laughs> but at least have it tested. You know, we have the equipment. We can tell you if the battery is bad right now, and it can also do some predictive testing and analysis and let you know what the status is of the battery. That's well, one thing. And not just the battery, though, but even the dirt and corrosion on top, you can get all that stuff cleaned off. If you want to do that at home with baking soda and water, or, you know, we can do it in the shop if it's if it's dirty. But even even that dirt and acid on the top can cause a, a parasitic load on the battery. Well, maintenances definitely don't have to happen before you leave. You mentioned if you do break down, you want some stuff in the car with you. So if you got to sit on the side of the road for a little while, you know, snacks. You said snacks because of the little kids in your car, and best way to shut them up is to stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Here, put this in your mouth. <laughs> Chew on that for a while. Chew on this loaf Not of bread. sugar snacks. Well, snacks for a couple of reasons. Like like you said, David, we had a uh, couple of years ago, we drove up to northern Nevada. On the way back outside of Kingman, we were stuck. They closed Interstate 40. We're stuck on the side of the road for 90 minutes. You go crazy if they don't have something to eat, let alone if you break down and, God forbid, you're stuck somewhere overnight or something. You probably definitely want to have a snack. I could probably live a little longer than most. Roadside. <laughs> <laughs> you're going to survive, I'm pretty sure. It's, I've got Matt is totally bald. There's no hair on his head. His brother came with him today, who I've never met, and there's no hair on his head either. I'm looking across the... You've got it all over your back and, and, uh, <laughs> and neck, I, I see. I guess I could you know, donate some hair. Maybe that would help out. But Yeah. Well, one of the other things, and you, again, Dave, you wouldn't need this if you worked out. I would probably need a blanket in the car where you, like the woolly mammoth... Mm-mm. Yeah, no blanket. <laughs> you wouldn't need a blanket. I can survive. Uh, but you might want to have a cell... Well, we all have cell phones. Make sure you bring the charger so if you do break down, you can you can uh, get a hold of somebody maybe. Uh, flares or a way to start a fire. If you're broken down, changing the tire somewhere. You know, I like the... LED ones, they don't take up any room. They're nice and bright. You can throw them somewhere in the car, but you can't start a fire with those if you if you needed one. Roadside kit. A good roadside kit is a good idea to have in the car. What's in it? Flashlights, good thing. Gloves is a good thing. Gloves for sure. Flares is a good thing. Those are good for starting fires, like you mentioned. Mm-hmm. you got to start a fire. Uh, I'm trying to think what else is in Chain. there. Chain. Uh. Chain. The problem Dude, is... What are you going to fix anymore on the side of the road? You're not necessarily going to fix anything. No, there's nothing that... In ninety nine percent of the time, I would say there's not, <laughs> not much you're going to fix on the side of the road. <laughs> you see people. I hate to laugh, but you see them broken down, and and the typical guy, honey, I'll get out, check it, opens the hood, and he's got a late model car, stand there, scratches his head, and I'm, and I'm thinking to myself that I'm going the other direction. There's not a damn thing you can do. <laughs> I wouldn't even bother to get out of the car and pop the hood, probably because I know. There's nothing I can probably do either in most you cases. Just stand on the there and look road. like you know what you're doing. You got to lift that hood just to see if there's something simple. Maybe I was a Jeep tour mechanic while I was the, going to school. Play the part. And uh, one of the Jeeps broke down. One of the U joints broke down. And this and the guys were all cowboys. You know, they wore guns and they they were just cowboys, big belt buckles, the whole nine yards. And this Jeep rolls back in. All and hat, the, no cattle. The, the guy used bailing wire uh, to fix the U joints. The U joint was broken. Bailing wire made it all the way back home. Uh, it was a pretty good idea, but. You're probably not going to do that. So put bailing wire in your roadside kit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Well, you know, and I said chain, but then if I have a chain in the back of my truck, I don't want anybody to know it's there, just like jumper cables, because uh, mm. I don't really want to – not that I don't want to help people. You're not helpful? I'm not breaking my car for you. <laughs> <laughs> and and same thing with jumper cables. Uh, you know, if you've got them and somebody needs help and you're going to help somebody with a jump start, you need to be careful – and make sure you don't damage your car. Hook those cables up. Follow the order. How you do it. And the other one we talked about this before the show is a jumper box. I like jumper boxes much Way better. better. Yeah. Way better. Less opportunity for wrecking stuff. Yeah. The You know, the thing with the getting a jump start on a late model car, it, it doesn't matter if you're the dead car or you're the, the jumping car. Turn on your headlights. And, w- and what the headlights will do in a lot of cases, they act as the um, – Surge protector, because if you get a spike of electricity without the headlights on, that could find its way to the computer and stuff. So that's a one little tidbit of info to help you out. Well, when we come back, we've got open lines. It's 602-277-5827. We're talking about anything about your car, 602-277-5827. You can also text us at 411-923. And later on in the show, we're going to be telling you about the top 10 Christmas gifts for the automotive enthusiasts, you're listening to Bumper to Bumper Radio. 
Well, welcome back to Bumper to Bumper Radio. I am Dave Riccio here along with Matt Allen, and we are talking about your car, getting ready to go on a road trip. And the other thing is, you know, some cars are good A to B cars. You know, the car's 15 years old. It's, it's fine around town, but it's not designed to drive back and forth between here and New York. So if you are making a road trip, sometimes just go rent a car. A, make sure there's no extra charges for taking it out of state, but go rent a car. They're, you know, you don't see a rental car with too much more than twenty or 30,000 miles on oh, them. Oh, never. Usually they're, I mean, I get them, and they're, they're sub-10,000 usually. These things are like brand new, you know, so take take a rental car. I mean, you well, get a minivan for 48 bucks a day. Talk about being that guy. Can you imagine? Yeah. Uh, the the wrath that you might be, get being broken down, honey. I checked. Yeah, we're good. Don't worry about it. We'll <laughs> save that hundred bucks on the rental car. Be a bad day in my household, <laughs> right? If we ended up uh, stuck in a tow truck. So the uh, just the peace of mind. Yeah, if you got areas sometimes. for concern, or your car does break down right before you're headed out of town, you don't trust it yet. Take a rental car. Or easy well, way to go. Well, the other thing too, you know, maybe you take the little four door family sedan, but you've got the. The gifts and the, you know, it's cold, so we've got extra clothes. Maybe we're going skiing. Now we've got this car pushed to the limit. Mm-hmm. Get the minivan, rent the bigger car, rent, 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 rent the town car. Treat yourself a little bit, right? Right. Well, Matt's buddy Pascal is here, and he was saying during the break, just make sure all that stuff is tied down because you're driving the SUV, you got to slam on the brakes. Next thing you know, you get hit with something from the back seat. The second accident, <laughs> bolted down. Well, the other thing too is is people get a false sense of security with uh, four wheel drive. Mm. Four wheel drive doesn't stop you any better. Mm. It, it may help you go better depending on where you are, and it definitely will if you're in a snowy road. But don't make the mistake either. Of, ah, road closed, just like the water. I got four wheel drive. Yeah, we can th- get through there. <laughs> then you're gonna wish you had that blanket when you break down or get stuck. So, up first this segment, let's go with Carl in Phoenix on a 2009 Ford Fusion. Go ahead, Carl. You're on bumper to bumper radio. Actually, Dave, he's not. We've got Paul up. I pushed the wrong button. So, Carl, you're going to hang on a second. And Paul in Sun City with the 95 Caddy. What can we help you with? Okay, first, before I get into the car, I would like to know what uh, jump uh, box that you recommend. I had two, and I paid about 80 bucks for them, I think. And they were good for a while. I usually ended up jumping other people's cars. But that was fine, and I know they drain and stuff, but sometimes the lights wouldn't work, so you wouldn't know, or the whole thing wouldn't work after a while. So I was wondering, can you give me a a recommendation on a good box and brand? Yeah, Paul, you know, I I don't know the the brand of them, but uh, I just picked some up at my shop at the uh, the, uh, Batteries Plus. And, and they're good. And what you all those jumper boxes really are, they're a, a plastic or composite box, and then inside of them is a is a motorcycle battery. Or I've seen a it, it looks just like a motorcycle battery or a battery you might have as a backup for an alarm system or some computerized uh, thing on the. Uh, <laughs> You're passing me notes. You can't pass to, notes to Matt. Always on the air. He just uh, you know, some, like a some, squirrel. Some other com- some other computerized device. So anyway, I like the one at Batteries Plus. You can probably get them at Harbor Freight. You can probably find them online in some other places. And uh, then Paul, did you have a second question? Yeah, that okay. was a big one. But the other one is, I got this old caddy and I love it to death. I know you shouldn't be, uh, you know, have uh, emotions when it comes to metal. But uh, I just love the ride on it. It's got some issues, but I don't have a lot of money to deal with it. It's got a slow oil leak, and so I'm dealing, I'm, I'm dealing with that simply by making sure my oil levels are good, and it's a slow leak. Is there any upside to making that better, or is it just something if it's just a slow leak that doesn't seem to impact in the between oil changes very much, just let it go? I know on one of my other caddies that I had, I spent like a thousand dollars and put them to seal and stuff, and it didn't seem to make the car last any longer. I just need your feelings on that. Right. Well, you know that I think that's where a relationship with a shop comes in into play, and you can ask them, "Show me this oil leak." I like to do the show and tell at my shop. Go out, look at it, so you can fully understand. You could probably gauge on that '95 Cadillac by looking at the ground. That one's not going to be one that has a bunch of shields underneath it to protect it. Look at what your garage looks like. And then ask the shop, ask the technician or the service advisor, is there anything else happening because of this oil? One, is it low between services? And if it's not, I think that you already answered your question as to whether how how 
how not necessary, but how how uh, high in the priority scale is that leak, or is it causing damage to anything else? Dave? Well, yeah, there's annoyance leaks, and if it's not, I mean, you're not losing more than a half a quart in in in, in the case of uh, between oil changes. You know, it's it's going to be annoying on your driveway, but get a good get, get a good pan. And uh, check your oil regularly, you know. The other thing I think about with leaks, are they annoyance leaks or are they problem leaks? It depends on how much oil the component holds. True. So if you have a transfer case leaking, for instance, it holds two quarts. Any leak is a big leak on a transfer case. But an engine that holds five or six quarts, it's not going to be in the world if it goes a half quart low over the course of 3,000 miles. Yeah, and I think he might have the North Star engine in that Cadillac. That's a mm. uh, spendy one to expense it, yeah, fix leaks on. They can be expensive. So, Paul... Thanks for the call. Carl, it is, I've got to figure out if I can push the right button this time. Carl in Phoenix on the Ford Fusion. What can we help you with? Yes, um, whenever I'm driving my Ford just on the highway, and uh, I give it a little bit of gas, you know, just to maintain speed, the car starts jolting almost like it's misfiring. Can't quite figure out what's going on. Dave? That's what, what I'm thinking. thinking. <laughs> I mean, first thing that came to my mind was misfire before he said that. Uh, yeah, it's misfiring. It may not set. Sometimes we see these cars come in, and, and it's jerking on the freeway. That's when you're going down, the transmission is all settled in, locked up, and you're driving. And any time the engine misfires, you feel it through the whole truck, uh, yeah. truck or car. And uh, you go into the auto shop, they'll scan it. They won't see a misfire code. They'll say, no, it's running great. Well, and you don't, exactly. you don't need a code to be able to figure out how to fix a car either. I mean, they're they're... We can go in and we can count misfires depending on which scan tools you have. If you have the right, the factory equipment, you can go in and see exactly how many times each cylinder is misfiring. Excuse me, but I, I looked at you, Dave, because oh, so many times when we talk about misfire problems, it actually ends up being a transmission problem. I was thinking torque converter. I wasn't, it's just the first thing that came to my head because that seems to be the answer lately. It's a, it's a job a week at my shop. Someone brings me a car and it's doing exactly what you're talking about. It's kind of jolting and what I would call stuttering. And when they're driving on the road and they think they've got a transmission issue. And, and many times they went and saw their mechanic and the mechanic said, oh, it sounds just like a transmission or torque converter issue. We get it in our shop and we find it to be a misfire. And it's not a misfire where it's high enough in the misfire count to actually trip a code. So a lot of times people will brush it off and they won't really see it rather than sit there and just, just lightly load that motor at a stop and just see if you can get one of the cylinders to start missing or a coil to break down or plug to break down, something like that. So... Thanks so much for the call. What else, road trip wise, Matt? Do you think uh, you think people should keep in mind? Mm, well, keeping the one thing that we talked about, and again, Pascal here was <laughs> saying, is keeping the fuel tank full. You know, I'll I'll be the one to stretch, and I'll say, well, I know it's. You know, I can make it to this gas station. I've made this road trip several times before, and every time I pull in there, the fuel light comes on just before I get there. Well. Maybe you want to run on the top half of the tank. You do get broken down. You do get in the in the shutdown. Well, I always make wrong turns and I get lost. So you want to have extra gas to spare. We got a lot of good texts with some good ideas for stuff to have in your car on road trips. Things not to do. When we come back, we've got open lines at 602-277-5827. 602-277-KTR. You can text us at 411-923. And we've got that shopping list. Well, welcome back to Bumper to Bumper Radio. I'm Dave Riccio. He is Matt Allen. We've got open lines at 602-277-5827, 602-277-KTAR, taking phone calls in regard to your car. Anything you want to talk about your car, give us a call. We'll try to answer it. If not, like I said, we'll make something up. And we've got a couple interesting texts here about... Uh, Some of these are interesting, Dave. <laughs> One says, carry a candle in your car, and if, if it'll keep you warm, let it burn. <laughs> and then <laughs> peanut butter cures hiccups. So I don't know, quite know what to do with that. But, I'm uh, not sure. There, Dave, there was another one that uh, somebody had a tried to jumpstart a car with a jumper box, and, and it was dark, and they couldn't see, and they hooked up the, the cables backwards and want to know if they fried the solenoid. I'm not quite sure. You know, Maybe if it was a Ford or maybe someone's referring to a starter solenoid. Uh, if you did it quick, you might have got lucky and not done anything. So you know, you may have the problem that you started with where you needed the jump start and maybe created another one. Typically, when that happens, you really don't blow a bunch of stuff up, so to speak. 
we usually find the main fuse. They call it a maxi fuse. It's either 60, 70, maybe 80 amp main mm. fuse to the I'm fuse 80, box. I'm thinking 82 amp. But, uh, 82 amp, yes. <laughs> we also got one here on a 2013 Chevy Silverado. Uh, I think he's got 3,500 miles on it. Did his first oil change, changed over to synthetic fluid, and his car still says it needs an oil change. The car doesn't know he changed oil. It's yes. Got, He's, he's asking, is it because of the type of oil is different so the car's not recognizing it? There's no necessarily sensors in the engine that are checking the you know, capacity of the oil life or anything like that, but that's just an estimation program that uh, based on average operating temperature, stop and go driving, how you drive the car, when that oil's going to be worn out. Yeah, there's a whole algorithm there. So unless you reset that oil life indicator to know that it's got new oil in there, it's got no way to know. So probably what I would do is just go ahead and reset it, determine when you're going to do your oil changes. I guess I would do it every 5,000 miles if that were a new truck. I like to get however you get there, get on that 5,000-mile interval. Then it's 5, 10, 15, 20, and so on. Reset the light when it comes on. But other than that, I would, I would typically just ignore it if you're going to stick to that time frame. Otherwise, Yeah, I use synthetic oil light. myself only because I plan on abusing the heck out of the car. I mean, I just full throttle or no throttle, slam on the brakes. You really weren't quite sure what you were allowed to say. The first <laughs> I, know, I, I, had to, I had to filter, 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 filter. <laughs> we've got Kevin and Paul, and then we've got Nick, and he's got a question about shop supplies, and that's a that's a hot topic there in the automotive business. Go ahead, Nick. You're on Bumper to Bumper Radio. Hi, Dave and Matt. Nice to talk to you. Uh, as an ex-automotive um, jobber for 30 years in California, I have a question. When, when I got out of the automotive business in 95, our shop labor was $22 an hour. And we had no think, such thing as shop supplies. And now you take your vehicle to a shop, independent or dealership, and you always end up with a bill for shop supplies. And I just had a, uh, the back of a driver's seat replaced at a local GM. It's a leather seat. I poked a hole in it. I wanted a new one. Uh, two hundred seventy-five dollars in parts and twenty-seven fifty in shop supplies, and I questioned that. And they said, "Well, they charge everybody ten percent of the parts," and it, and it just kind of ridiculous, you know. What what shop supplies can you use when you put a new leather slide a, a seat cover over? Besides a little bit of soap to wash your hands when you get done. Right. Well, I think but everybody pays it. Right. In some cases, I think there's there's times, and we do it in our shop, where there's somebody has to go away from policy and what the computer program says and apply some discretion. And, and we do it all the time. There's certain jobs where it just doesn't make sense, where, where there might be a shop supply or even an environmental handling fee or anything like that. But I think in the... In the modern era, it's something that everybody does. We have there is an immense amount of regulation, insurance with handling of of environmental fees, shop supplies, same thing. We go through oodles and oodles and oodles of different shop supplies, and, and it's miscellaneous stuff that we may you know hose clamps sometimes, cleaners, fluids that we don't charge for. If we had to itemize all the stuff that we might use on a particular service job on it you'd add another page to your invoice and they'd be you know 40 and 90 cents and a buck 25 you'd add you'd add 20 more line items to to an invoice so and i think those started shop supplies started showing up on invoices maybe somewhere in the early 90s well you know i remember uh yeah late 80s early 90s at the when you started seeing computers in the shop right that's what the uh some of the computer salesmen in this, the auto shop management software writers, that was kind of their their uh, way to get in. So you can buy this computer and see in this program we've added here 3% shop supplies. So that right there pays for this system. That was their selling tool. Mm. But it, 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 it's in some cases it, it's not – it gets out of proportion right. on some cars. And uh, but it's a it's a fee that's there for for very good reason. It is expensive to run a repair shop. Matt and I go round and round about this topic. <clears throat> we don't charge shop supplies. It's the the money or the income is still there on the invoice. Whether you spell it out or don't spell it out is is really the difference. To me, I always felt like it feels like a nickel and dime charge, even though it's a real charge and there's real like, shop supplies that go into it. I think it you know can rub people wrong, and then you know some people it doesn't rub wrong. But like in your case, you got a seat fixed. Really, they took a seat out, put a seat in, 
four nuts, nuts and bolts, whatever, that I really have shop supplies. So it's one. Yeah. It's like it's like paying tax. You pay for everybody. Well, it's it's. I guess if somebody called and told you the hamburger was nine dollars and you paid nine dollars, and then you got the bill and you saw, you know, and you saw it broken and down mustard. ketchup and lettuce and mustard, and then just cleaning the cleaning the oven was factored in there, but it was separated. It just tastes different. It, it feels a little different. Feels so. a little different. It's my saying that do you pay for the napkins at McDonald's? <clears throat> you don't because they're just figured in the price of the burger. That's my thing, and that's where the nickel and dime thing comes from for me. So appreciate the call, Nick. Hopefully that educate everybody on shop supplies and why they're charged or not charged. We're going to go with Kevin in Chandler on a 1997 Honda CRV. Go ahead, Kevin. You're on Bumper to Bumper Radio. Good morning, gentlemen. Show is fabulous. Advice priceless. My drive line broke on my 97 Honda CRV, which is an all-wheel drive. So instead of replacing it, I took it off and went from an all-wheel drive <laughs> to a front-wheel drive. <laughs> Well, that hurt the transmission in the front. It should not the way a CRV works. I mean, it just basically the transmission is is what it is. They just bolt on this thing called a side gear. It's not really a – you could call it a trans, transfer case if you wanted to, but it's bolted right on the side of the transmission, and the, the right front axle runs through it, and then you've got a drive shaft going to the rear. Uh, I'm not sure it's good for that side gear, but I don't. I think it will continue to work as long as it – no, nothing stopped. There was always bailing wire, though. <laughs> is that a pretty sophisticated transfer case or, or side box in that? You know, and there's BMW and some of the other all-wheel drive models. They're applying different uh, right. slip, if you will, or different different levels of lockup on that on that uh, transfer case. I would Honda's- say on a '97 Honda, it's so it's so big, archaic. It literally just is an angle gear. There's not much there. No brains. On some of the later model stuff, yeah. Hey, we're turning. We're, we're applying it more or less depending on the needs of the car based off speed sensors at all four of the wheels. But on the CRV 97, you know, you can run with it, you know, without it. Yeah, and some of those drives, they're not real popular. You don't see them fail a lot, and they can they can be expensive to, uh, to fix. To fix, yeah. For sure. Thanks so much for the call, Kevin. We're going to go with Paul in Prescott, and we've got open lines at 602-277-5827. Go ahead, Paul. Two thousand looks like two thousand three Dodge Ram twenty five hundred. You're on Bumper to Bumper Radio. Hey, thanks, guys, for taking my call. Um, yeah, I've got a, I've got an O three Dodge Ram twenty five hundred. It's got the five seven Hemi in it, and uh, it keeps giving me fan clutch noises, first, second, third gear at higher RPMs, and then when it shifts into overdrive, it seems to mellow out and not be so loud. But I've replaced the fan clutch twice. And I still have this problem. And then when I, like, if I drive down to Phoenix, it it goes away. Also, it doesn't. It, the, the like the fan clutch slows down and, and works like it should. But up here in the higher altitude, it doesn't seem to work right. Now, when you say fan clutch noises, I, I'm assuming you're you're saying like when the fan clutch would lock up in a hot weather condition, where you get that loud whirling noise of the fan from under the hood. Exactly. Exactly. What kind of fan clutch are you buying that you're replacing it with? You know, I don't know. I just go to the auto parts store and I got one and then I exchanged I, I put the first one with the factory one and I took that one off that was completely locked up and then I bought an aftermarket one and I, I couldn't tell you what brand name they were so but at least you do know the the, the original equipment one that you bought the factory one was locked up completely it, it was, okay so we didn't fix something that was unnecessary I would beginning to be wondering if I had a good quality fan clutch, if you got it at, would, the, at the local Acme Auto Parts, or that's the thing I'm thinking of. Some of these, some of these aftermarket fan clutches, they have what we call as a you know a hot soak problem. So the vehicle gets nice and hot, and you're driving it, you shut it off. Well, it's still nice and hot, so all the fluid is on one side, and then it gets closed. The valve inside there that moves the fluid from one side to the other, it closes back up. So when you start it back up in the morning, it's going to be it's still pulling like it's still hot, you know, mm. even though it's cool out. So I'm just an OE fan clutch believer. I'm not not a fan of the aftermarket stuff. Well, is a fan clutch another one of those things that can give you weird transmission sensations oh. and feelings? And that's probably why you're like that. You've probably been bit enough times with the aftermarket clutches. That's, that's exactly. What, I mean, summertime comes summertime, we get people you know rolling in. My transmission's slipping because the engine is roaring heavier than it normally is, and you got to put a lot more gas in it to make it go because you have the extra load of the fan. And with that going on, we sell a lot of fan clutches at the transmission shop. Good news and bad news. Bad news is you need a fan clutch. Good news is you don't need a transmission. Right. So what would you do? I guess I'd go maybe go to the dealer, get an original fan clutch, or go back to where you bought that one, try and find out where that is in the quality scale. 
It should be the most expensive, the best one that they possibly could have. And if it's not that one, then you want to go to the dealer and get an OE one. Yeah, and be careful the heavy duty ones because the heavy duty ones can cause issues. Because the heavy duty, you want more fan pulling, and you don't necessarily whatever the factory design is is fine with me. As we promised, I've got Santa's top ten. Christmas lists for your automotive enthusiast. Until your friend uh, Pascal came in here and blew holes in my list, I, I was feeling, I was feeling pretty confident about it. But uh, I got number. There's a few selfish ones in here because I know my wife is listening. So, honey, take notes. Um, number ten. I don't think you go wrong with number ten. Is a good tire gauge. You gotta get a good tire gauge for a stocking stuffer if you got an automotive enthusiast in your house. If he's got one already, he won't mind having two. That's just or a digital one. And if you're looking for a good one, you know, you're driving around town, start looking at auto repair shops. When you see a Snap-on truck or a Matco tool truck or one of those guys, pop in. You don't want the dollar ninety nine one in the can next to the cash register. In the counter at Walgreens, it's probably not going to work out so good. So this was number nine is a good one. Uh, Pascal's idea, I think, or maybe it was no, Bob's. Was Your idea? Yeah. No. Oh, yeah, you stole it off of somebody else's site. <laughs> yes. <But> <laughs> automotive magazine subscription. I mean, that's pretty That's pretty sexy. I wouldn't mind getting that for Christmas. Like so road and track. Or road and track, Week, car or... and driver. So that's a good one. At number eight, we've got an automotive detailing kit. So I'm going to buy my wife one of those so she can detail my car. I've got one of those. That's my <laughs> debit card when you go to the car wash. <laughs> so another one we mentioned, and maybe you got to get this one before Christmas. Like, you ever open up Christmas gifts on Christmas Eve? I know we were allowed to open one when I was a kid. Pajamas. Emergency roadside kit with a flashlight. Flashlight was one on the top ten, but uh, I didn't have room for it, so I stuffed it in with the roadside with, kit. With the kit, yes. <laughs> and what should be in that? Well, we talked about what should be in the kit. Maybe some... Flash, well, flashlight, jumper cables, all kinds of little gadgets. Well, when we come back, we're going to finish the last six, 680, 602-277-5827. You're listening to Bumper to Bumper Radio. My pappy said, son, you're going to drive me to drinking if you don't stop driving that hot rod Lincoln. Bumper to Bumper on News Talk 92.3 KTAR. I think it's time for a new song. The song used to be good when Matt actually drove a Lincoln, but it's yeah, no was funny that? anymore. What was that, my 96 town car? He looked really good at it. He hung his hand over the steering wheel. Actually, it was kind of feminine. Anyway. Kind of like the way you drive your element. <laughs> Welcome back to Bumper to Bumper Radio. I'm Dave Riccio. He's Matt Allen. And right now we're doing the top 10 Christmas gifts for your automotive enthusiast in your house. And, honey, please take notes. We are on number six, mechanics gloves. There is nothing better than a good set of mechanic gloves. And that's actually a brand name. That's mechanics with an X, mechanics. Spelled that wrong there, Dave. Honey, get that? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's always good. I, I have a pair of gloves. You don't. I got to have a pair of gloves. Whether you're broken down or loading something at Home yeah, Depot. Yeah, you want to or... change a tire, throw them in the back, junk in the, more junk in the trunk. So <laughs> mechanics gloves. At number five, we've got a floor jack, and the key here for safety is a good set of jack stands. So uh, if you've got a hubby that needs a new floor jack and jack stands, that's a great Christmas gift. Or if you don't like them, you could X out the jack stands. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Exactly. And then up the life insurance. <laughs> and get the cheap floor jack. And, and, and number three, honey, this is where you come in. A gun safe for the car and maybe a rifle rack for the back window of the car. Honda they, Element with a rifle rack in the back. What do you think of that? <laughs> well, that's true. They do make a little small hand, small size gun safe to, uh, you know, if you have someone that carries a, a pistol in the car. And right. That needs to be secured, especially with the kids around and don't want anybody to steal it and hide that baby right in there. Well, I got to go floss my tooth. Uh, <laughs> number two, and I thought it was a great idea, send somebody to driving school. You can get one of those driving school packages. Maybe you got a teenager just learning how to drive. Man, that's a great gift. Well, you know, the, send them out to Bondurant the for Bob, the day. Bob Bondurant school. You get the high performance school. You got the teen driving school. You got all kinds of stuff out there. Number one, drum roll, please. <laughs> Gift certificate to Tri City Transmission. No, that's not what I meant. Virginia Auto <laughs> Service gift certificate. <laughs> An air compressor. You know, air compressor would be fantastic. You know, I mean, good air compressor. Not like one of the cheapy ones. You know, from <laughs> from wherever. <laughs> Is that enough? When you got a good air compressor, you can run that guy, and that's when your your man status goes up. Your man card gets bigger. <laughs> well, the compressor's good for the car, blowing things out, cleaning, uh, airing kids' bicycle tires. Oh, it's, pumping up footballs, pumping up bike tires. It's good to have a good compressor on that. And if you have a good compressor, have a good spare ball and a good spare tire. <laughs> inner tube. You know how many tire inner tubes people we 
we're like the local gas station at my shop. Everybody going down 7th Street on a bicycle, they pop in to fill those tires, and we say, you can borrow it, but we're not buying the tube. You don't have any tires. We, that, we don't blow up. They get blown up. And right. You can Boom. let them rip. So up for this segment, we're going to go with Carly in Phoenix on a 1999 Nissan Pathfinder. Go ahead, Carly. You're on Bumper to Bumper Radio. Hi, guys. Hello. Um, my question, I'm not sure if it's my tires, if it's shocks or what, but um, I had my wreck and pinion replaced about seven months ago, and I feel, I mean, every time I hit any little bump in the road, I feel it hits so hard, like it'll actually take my steering wheel. And, um, you know, I've gotten several opinions on whether it is tire-related, whether it's related to the rack and pinion replacement or shocks or what. Well, did it start happening? Why did you have the rack and pinion replaced? And then- because that went out. The rack and pinion went out. Um, uh, on a so- date? I mean, did it, did it start? Was it leaking or what was... Do you, do you know um, why? And then, but hold on a second. And then, did this problem that you're experiencing now, this feeling or sensation, was that immediately after, or did it come sometime during that seven months later? You know, I really, I'm not sure. I think, I think it's. I don't know if it happened like shortly thereafter, but I don't recall it being that bad prior to the rack and pinion being replaced. Okay. And then, well, what I would do is go back to the shop that you had the rack and pinion replaced, which. Hopefully it's your your regular place that's got the history on the car and everything, and ask them to double check that and explain to them what you're feeling. A rack and pinion, I don't think that that would uh, cause like the thing that got me is take the steering wheel out of your hand a little bit. If there's something in the valving that maybe that wasn't rebuilt or remanufactured right, but it very well could be bad front end parts. You could have a bushing or a ball joint or something. You could, of course. On a 99, if the shocks have not been replaced, that would be something I would definitely be looking at. But we really just need to get that front end checked out, shaken down, what we would call shake down the front end. We're going to ch- just check all the linkages, all the steering components, the, the the shocks, everything. And then we'll know. And it could be one thing that's causing the problem. It could be a little bit of give in three or four things that all that adds up to, to one problem. So it, it just needs a good inspection. Thanks so much for the call, Carly. We're going to go with John in Phoenix on a 2011 Dodge Grand Caravan. Go ahead, John. You're on Bumper to Bumper Radio. Um, when it was really cold, the, uh, my brake light uh, came out for just a second when uh, first starting out. I checked the uh, brake fluid. It was just a little bit low, so I was just kind of figuring it was just cold and uh, uh, was going to t- pop it off, just top it off and not worry about it. But somebody was telling me that because uh, it was black, that it should be get uh, replaced or, or flossed. Well, yeah. yeah, yeah, John. A brake fluid. We have actual test strips that we can use in the shop to test the quality of the brake fluid, and and the brake fluid should be flushed occasionally. Most of the European manufacturers will tell you every two years that fluid needs to be changed. I used to work at Porsche when the Porsche Club people would want to come in and go out on the track with their car. It's a requirement for every year to have that that brake fluid changed to pass the, the tech inspection. The American manufacturers don't recommend it so much, but again, there's a test that we can do for that. And you'd be surprised. Sometimes the black coffee-looking brake fluid not bad. fails that test just fine, but we still make the recommendation to change it just, just based off the visual. But more importantly than that, cars don't, and I'm not concerned about it on your car being a problem necessarily, but cars just don't periodically need brake fluid. Mm-hmm. So if that fluid is low... What you've got in there, there's a there's a float, an electronic sensor, and when the brake fluid goes down, it's going to turn on the light, the red light in the dash, to, to warn you of the problem. But the reason that's low is because your brakes are wearing down. And as the brakes wear down, the calipers extend out, the fluid has to take up that space. So what that's an indicator of, you might want to check, have your brakes checked to make sure the front brakes are not worn to the point of replacement. We had a little bit of follow-up on the text earlier about the synthetic oil and the 2013 Silverado. And his question is really more so, can I go longer without oil changes because I now have the synthetic fluid in there? And that's a good question. And, you know, you could technically go longer. It's going to last longer. That's not why I use synthetic fluid. I use synthetic fluid because if I want to drive drive it like a race car, it's just better protection. So I do a 5,000-mile interval on my synthetic fluid that I use in my car. Well, and you're right, Dave. My recommendation when people do the synthetic, they always ask, can I go longer? And it's not longer. It's the added protection. You overheat. 
Maybe you're not going to overheat that brand new car now, but three years from now, and the hose blows and overheats. It may be the difference between uh, buying an engine and not buying an engine. And I, in that case, I would still maybe follow the uh, what do you call it? The uh, pr- the oil life monitor because that car probably uses the Dexos. It's a late model GM. It might already require full synthetic oil anyway. Well, thanks for joining us. Remember, if you're looking for a good shop, bumper to bumper radio dot com. While you're there, be sure to like us on Facebook. If you got a relationship with a great shop, stick with them. Thanks, Peter, for running the dials. Remember never to text and drive. Next week, we're going to fill you in on gonculator valves, dual overhead mouse traps, muffler bearings, high speed blinker fluid. That's halogen type, of course. And any other car topics you might want to talk about. I'm Dave Riccio. He is Matt Allen. And for a great shop, bumper to bumper radio.com. We'll be back next week.